It's my great honor to introduce the Consul General, Herbert Quelle, this evening. He was born in Herford, Germany, and after studying political science and English, he joined the Federal Foreign Office in 1980, which was still in Bonn, West Germany's capital at the time. He served for the German government in postings all over the world, in Los Angeles, Pretoria, Havana, Warsaw, London, Baku, the capital of Azerbaijan, and less exotically, uh, Boston. <laughs> He's been the, the German Consul General in Chicago since July 19, uh, 19, 2014. Drawing on his experience, he's been lecturing extensively on the refugee crisis, and I first heard Mr. Quella speak almost exactly a year ago at Indiana University when he spoke on the same topic, uh, their German unification and the refugee crisis, and it was a very exciting uh, talk, so I'm, you're in for uh, quite a treat tonight. One year ago, Europe was faced with waves of refugees, many from Syria, but also from Afghanistan, Iraq, and Africa. Some attempted to cross the Mediterranean in hopelessly inadequate boats, and many hundreds of thousands traveled on foot over the Balkans. Many of these asylum seekers were heading specifically for Germany, and I am sure Mr. Quella will speak about that this evening, and how Germany is coping, coping with this huge wave of refugees. My German class watched the situation from afar by reading the newspaper headlines at the beginning of each class period. Like many, I became very interested in the many questions surrounding the crisis. This past summer, when I was in Germany, I had the chance to visit a language cafe in Trier, Germany, and met some refugees from Syria myself, got to learn about their stories. This semester, I'm teaching a section of first year seminar and have taken the stories of refugees as my focus. And both my German and my first year seminar classes are attending this evening. Welcome, class. So it is with great interest that I am looking forward to Mr. Quella's talk this evening, The Refugee Crisis in Europe and Its Impact on the European Union. Please join me in giving him a warm Marian welcome. Thank you. Test, test, okay, it works. <laughs> Dear uh, Professor Westphal, uh, Vice Provost, um, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, an honor for me to be invited to this prestigious lecture um, series. I was here last year about the same time uh, and listened to uh, Dan Coates speak. Um, I don't know if any of you were uh, with us at that stage and that was uh, sort of the um, beginning of this endeavor of Pierre Atlas getting me here to join for this lecture series and I, when he approached me on that I was very happy to, um, to uh, uh, attend. Uh, and thanks also for your interest in this uh, uh, topic. In my opinion, it is of the highest <coughs> relevance. Uh, the plight of refugees uh, represents a huge humanitarian challenge, and it has uh, the potential to change uh, the European political landscape. I will try in the following 30 minutes or so to update you on the situation in Europe and in my own country, uh, Germany. Uh, let me state at the beginning uh, that uh, not every viewpoint I express represents one-to-one uh, -one the official position of the German government. I don't think I'm contradicting uh, any of those, but I reserve the right to have individual views on certain aspects of the issue. This is not the first time I'm speaking on the subject this week. Uh, you've heard that I've lectured uh, frequently and I'm uh, past the 50 mark uh, since September last year. I was uh, two days ago in uh, Cincinnati. And that was a moving, very moving uh, invitation that I had received there because when I was in Cincinnati earlier this year in April, I met with a young uh, gentleman uh, 
Israeli-American parents, Israeli-American family, and uh, the parents had been uh, with their son in Germany, and he was revisiting uh, Germany this summer to stay with uh, friends and uh, family in other family in Ulm, Germany. And what did he do during his vacation in Germany? This young gentleman uh, volunteered uh, assisting uh, Syrian refugees in uh, Germany. And he is highly qualified. He's, a six, he's 17 years old and speaks Arabic, apart from Hebrew and English, of course, and is learning German. And uh, so he was working as an interpreter in a refugee camp in, in Ulm. And uh, the stories that he told me, uh, that he was told by these refugees, are just um, amazing. But I'm not giving you the micro view that he has had, I'm giving you the macro political view. So I started to give public talks about this, as was mentioned um, in September last year, when the refugee crisis, as we can call it, uh, actually uh, be, uh, began to be noticed, uh, not only in Germany and felt, but uh, I think globally. Not to the extent that I would think it should be um, uh, taken into account and uh, uh, that people should be aware of it, but still it, it became more known than it had been uh, in the years before because uh, the civil war in Syria, which is one of the main drivers of it, has been going on for over five years already. It started in 2011. And we have been receiving refugees in high numbers uh, since 2012, actually, in Germany. In high numbers means in the hundred thousands. Um, since September last year, uh, we've seen approximately, and that's an estimate, because we never have the right figures, 5,000 people drown in the Mediterranean. Uh, terrorists have exploited the situation. The border regime in Europe has temporarily changed. Migrant routes have adapted to these changes. A new relationship has developed between Turkey and the European Union. And elections in Europe, including in Germany, have shown a significant rise of right-wing populists. These are only the most important developments that need mentioning. What has not changed, however, is one of the root causes, a large destabilized region in the Middle East with its ongoing migration potential. With my talk tonight, I intend to do three things. I want to give you an idea of the dimension of the problem and put it into perspective. I want to analyze the problem foremost as a humanitarian crisis, but also look briefly at other aspects related to it, that is economic, security, demographic, and legal. And finally, I want to talk about what I see as the main challenge, namely uh, the balance between uh, the, what you could call the cohesion of the European Union and a values-based approach that has been taken by uh, Germany. That is, do we go for the least common denominator, uh, which many uh, people seem to, to want. We do not want refugees. It's the easy way out, I guess. Or uh, do we accept what is in our constitutions, what pa makes part, what fa forms part and an element of the European Union, um, self-consciousness uh, and what we are actually all obliged to under the Geneva Refugee Convention. So first about the dimension of the problem. The dimension of the problem is evident if you regularly follow the headlines about the ongoing war in Syria and the joint fight of the Western world against ISIS. Two cities stand out, uh, Aleppo and Mosul. 
Unfortunately, our hopes in establishing a stable ceasefire in Aleppo were not su successful a couple of weeks ago, and the situation of the ci civilian population there is simply catastrophic. Despite the ceasefire that uh, the Russians and the Syrian army announced uh, for beginning for today. Probably the time will be far too short for uh, the desperately needed um, relief efforts of the United Nations to reach uh, their goal. And probably more people will take the opportunity uh, to just uh, leave uh, this uh, uh, city. Um, and one can only pray that reconquering Mosul, the fight which started yesterday, reconquering it from, from ISIS, will succeed fast and not provoke similar suffering over there. The dimension of the problem is also evident for those who read background reports on developments in Afghanistan, Iraq I just mentioned, on Libya, and many other African uh, countries down to Yemen, of course. The dimension of the problem becomes clear and obvious by events like the Leaders' Summit on Refugees, which took place in New York on uh, the 20th of September, to which President Obama had invited a selected group of heads of government. I guess uh, some of you may have noticed the praise that the United States President had for German Chancellor Merkel's refugee policy. <clears throat> Representing Germany at that uh, event, um, my foreign minister, Mr. Steinmeier, said at the occasion, first, we have to address the root causes of flight and migration. We have to find political solutions to end the conflicts that are forcing millions of people from their homes. And we have to focus on poverty, inequality, and the violation of human rights. Second, we have to improve the global management of flight and migration. We need a coordinated approach. Third, we have to support and work closely with transit countries like Jordan or Lebanon, Niger or Kenya. We need to pursue a comprehensive approach linking migration, development, and security. And this we have to do together. We are also pursuing this approach within the European Union. To what extent, we can discuss later. And fourth, I'm still quoting, I believe that each and every one of our states also has to live up to their responsibility to help those in need. Again, this was at a meeting in New York at which the United States participated and where they were even hosts. The international or the regional uh, dimension of the problem is as follows. The United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and the International Organization for Migration, I will use abbreviations UNHCR and OIM, both of them agree that at the moment there are globally around 65 million refugees, 65 million refugees and internally displaced uh, persons. About one million migrants, so that is a relative small fraction of these, about one million migrants, in the majority refugees, according to the Geneva Refugee Convention, entered Germany last year, in one single year after the hundred thousands who had come already in previous years. Among uh, the people who came to Germany were also political asylum seekers from countries without a civil war, where conditions are not free, and uh, there were migrants who came for economic reasons, for whom other acceptance criteria are relevant. One million refugees in one year, that um, uh, equals roughly 1.5% of the population of Germany. We have 82 million inhabitants. And if you translate that into the United States, this would correspond to the United States accepting 4 million migrants in one year. And you know the figures how much or how many uh, the United States are taking in. The reason for the exodus from Syria is, I already mentioned that, the five-year-old uh, civil war. 
It started with the Arab Spring. Arab Spring, maybe that's a term that we do not want uh, or like to hear so, uh, so, long, so, so much anymore, um, because Spring always indicates that something is blossoming and uh, bearing fruit eventually. Uh, what has happened since then, I'm not doubting the motives, but what we see on the ground is not something that, um, uh, is, that should be copied. Uh, the attempts of the opposition uh, to oust Assad have so far uh, failed. Furthermore, ISIS is waging a brutal war in Syria and Iraq, and that terrorist activities extend to Europe and the United States. Uh, two million refugees are living in camps in Jordan, almost three million in Turkey. Smaller but still significant numbers uh, can be found in Lebanon and Iraq. About seven million people are displaced within Syria. This level of internally displaced people in the Middle East is unusually high and its origins go back to the war against Saddam Hussein in 2003. Germany did not participate in the war, and I don't want to get into a discussion between the candidates who at what time, in the United States, who at what time said that he was for or against it. I'm just giving you uh, the situation that um, uh, some of you may still recall, uh, namely the level of tension that this uh, decision of Germany not to go, not to join in the war caused between the Bush administration and the German federal government under then Chancellor Gerhard Schröder. You may also recall the distinction that Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld made between old and new Europe. Old applied to Germany and France, and new to states like Poland, Spain, and Ukraine, which joined and supported the US in that second Iraq war. It's interesting historically now to especially compare the position that Poland took at the time and that Poland is taking now with regard to refugees. In addition to roughly 600,000 Syrians who came to Germany last year, there were refugees from Afghanistan, Iraq, Eritrea, Nigeria, Yemen, Sudan, and so forth. They have come by themselves or with the aid of human traffickers or people smugglers, as we also call them, on the land route. Once migrants reach um, Italy or Greece, there are no longer difficult geographical hurdles. They find a perfect infrastructure of uh, roads and rail going north. If the borders are open, it is possible to simply walk. In early March, the Western Balkan countries closed their borders. They felt that they could no longer cope with the transiting refugees and they were afraid that refugees might have to stay if final destinations like Austria, Sweden or Germany would no longer accept them. There was a time when tens of thousands were stuck in Idomeni at the border between Macedonia and Greece earlier this year. In May, they were relocate, relocated to fully equipped camps. Macedonia is not a member state of the European Union, but it uh, has this border with uh, uh, Greece. And our southern EU partner, Greece, was simply overwhelmed uh, by the sheer numbers since summer 2015. In previous years, Italy had to carry the main burden uh, because people came uh, across the Mediterranean, uh, landing in, in Sicily, Lampedusa, and so forth. Um, but last, year, uh, last year's migrant numbers made anything we had seen before look small or pale. Greece could de facto not meet her obligations under the Dublin rules, which uh, stipulate that as the first country that people enter, you have to process them properly 
and uh, register them and then decide whether you give them uh, political asylum or whether you can let them pass on to other member states of the European uh, Union. Uh, so most migrants continued moving north um, and I always say it was not the selfie that the Syrian refugee took with uh, Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, where critics in Germany who claimed the Syrians came because she permitted that selfie with the refugee. No, they came because in uh, the Middle East, the definition of family is far larger than we are accustomed to the definition of family. Uh, of the people who had already reached Germany in 2012, 2013, some were third, fourth, fifth cousins of people who then came and they had told them we are treated fairly and so uh, why, don't you, why don't you join us? And um, uh, so, but with, with high numbers coming, also in Germany there were bureaucratic deficits and uh, uh, we took the bulk of refugees coming uh, in my country, about one million. Austria and Sweden took far less in absolute numbers, but even more than uh, Germany in relation to their uh, own populations. Uh, Austria is pretty small, has only eight million inhabitants, so a tenth of Germany. These three countries are normally uh, singled out as having had a relatively generous and open refugee policy in 2015. It's not exclusive, but if you read the, 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 the news, the papers of the time, it's normally these three countries. Um, to today, this has clearly changed in Austria and in Sweden, and in Germany there is, I have to be honest, also pressure from society to be less open, and I will come to that later. Coming back to the root causes of the migration from the Middle East that my foreign minister listed in New York, in order to counter the threat emanating from IS in the Middle East, Germany is also engaged in the fight against terror. We have provided Kurdish opposition fighters, the Peshmerga, with light weapons and we are training them. We are flying surveillance missions and providing allies with intelligence. We operate anti-missile systems on the Turkish border and we are uh, assisting other NATO forces in the Aegean Sea to control the access routes to Europe. At the same time, we have been pushing for ceasefire talks between the Syrian conflict parties. The meeting yesterday in Berlin with the heads of government from Russia, France, Ukraine did not only deal with the war in eastern Ukraine, but also with the Russian role in Syria. We haven't achieved much because Russia is simply too difficult at the moment. But most importantly, I would come to something that has been pretty much a German initiative, namely uh, the negotiations uh, to come to a deal with Turkey. The basic idea behind the talks with Turkey was the recognition of its crucial geographic location. And there's also the logic of the Geneva Refugee Convention. No country can oblige another country to deny refugees the entry, the entry to that country. But you can assist a country to properly control the exit of migrants from its territory. Most of the migrants who reached Europe last year had first passed through Turkey. So most of the migrants who reached Europe last year had first passed through Turkey or had even spent some time in Turkey, Turkish camps. So if Turkey is the main gatekeeper for migration, we have to cooperate with that country. It is, it is true. On the one hand, Turkey is an association country uh, of the European Union and a member of NATO. On the other hand, it is undeniable that President Erdogan is clamping down on civil liberties, restricting press freedoms, freedom, etc. And the Kurdish question is a further complication. 
the official reaction of Turkey to a resolution by the Bundestag on the Armenian genocide in 1915 was the latest escalation in our complex relationship a, a, a few months ago and the failed coup against President Erdogan and its aftermath have not helped in uh, stabilizing uh, relations either. You have to bear in mind that uh, Germany has a larger Muslim population with a far smaller population, total population, than the United States. We have over three million Muslims, and these Muslims are mostly from Turkey. And they have come as guest workers invited by uh, German uh, companies since the 19, uh, 1960s. Uh, so these uh, Turkish uh, German citizens um, are, uh, play, play uh, quite an important uh, role in, in the community where they live in, in densely populated uh, uh, cities. And uh, the Turkish governments have always been uh, involved in trying to maintain their votes. Turks can, can vote uh, even if they have lived uh, outside of the country for a long time in, in Turkey. And uh, so there have always been mobilization uh, campaigns by uh, the current AKP uh, Erdogan government also in, in Germany. And uh, at some stages we have actually been very concerned because uh, if um, somebody like uh, President Erdogan uh, preaches to his citizens in Germany that uh, as long as they are good Turkish citizens, they should not uh, uh, be too eager to integrate into German society. That is, of course, something that um, one can only raise one's eyebrows to. So anyway, uh, there is uh, a tentative agreement now between uh, the European Union and Turkey and uh, one uh, crucial effect of that has been that far less uh, people have emigrated from Turkey uh, to Germany than in 2015. What did Turkey get from the deal in return for better policing of her borders? Uh, Turkey got the promise to open new chapters in the accession negotiations with the European Union, got uh, the promise of 3 billion euros in subsidies for the refugee camps, um, and uh, the promise of visa liberalization if all preconditions, and some of them have not yet been met, but until they are met by Turkey. And one of these preconditions is that the uh, terrorism laws that they have instituted are simply too wide. They, if, if we as Europeans agreed uh, without having first committed to a change there, that would mean that we'd be uh, tolerating uh, the press freedom uh, clampdown that uh, I just mentioned in a critical uh, uh, vein. So, so much for the international or regional uh, dimension. Of the, of the bulk of refugees with, which we, with whom we have to deal. The domestic dimension is, um, uh, has, has been changing um, dependent on the number of people um, arriving in the country. Uh, in September 2015, uh, the German government decided to accept as many refugees as possible without setting a ceiling and the slogan was, Wir schaffen das, which can be translated as, we will manage. And that is a famous uh, sentence by Chancellor Merkel. And the reaction of the majority of Germans to that has been truly amazing. Uh, without, one, without hundreds of thousands of volunteers, we could never have coped when 10 to 15,000 migrants arrived daily at Munich Central Station. We provided a temporary shelter, we fed and we clothed the people, and as was to be expected, a minority at that stage, a uh, minority that has been gro growing, were opposed to what they claimed was an open door uh, policy. 
the state elections in Baden-Württemberg, uh, Sachsen-Anhalt and Rheinland-Pfalz. We are a federal uh, country, so it's not identical to the federal states that you have in the United States, but uh, there are certain uh, comparisons as to the independence of these um, states. So they, the state elections in Baden-Württemberg, Sachsen-Anhalt and Rheinland-Pfalz on March 13 showed a strong increase of frustrated and disenchanted voters on the right. The Alternative für Deutschland, AFD, Alternative for Germany, entered all state uh, parliaments. In Sachsen-Anhalt, it even became the second strongest party with over 20% um, uh, of, uh, uh, of the vote. Um, we don't have a parliamentary, we don't have a presidential system. Um, we have a parliamentary system, uh, which means that the, uh, uh, that the parties uh, have to form coalitions unless one party has the absolute majority in parliament, and then the parties form the government. So there's no conflict like in the United States between a president that may be totally different from the composition of uh, the Hill, the House, uh, and, the, and the Senate. So as long as uh, we uh, can, if you want, isolate uh, a party like Alternative für Deutschland in the opposition, there is no way that a phenomenon can happen that is possible in a presidential system like the United States, where uh, a candidate might be encompassing also those votes. In Germany, the IFD, uh, I assure you, even if they get 20%, will remain on the fringes, and I believe they are a um, uh, passing uh, phenomenon. Uh, or, or they will eventually become more normal, like the, 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 the left, the Linke, has also become over the years, because there is now a discussion uh, for the elections next year in September, uh, whether it is possible that the Social Democrats might form a coalition with the Linke, with the left party, and the Greens, and uh, thereby uh, substitute the current grand coalition, which is composed of the Christian Democratic Union, Christian, with a social, Christian social union from Bavaria, and the Social uh, uh, Democrats. So further state elections took place in mecklenburg pomerania and in Berlin in September. Again, the AFD, Alternative for, for Deutschland, entered the parliaments. The critical voices against Chancellor Merkel's refugee policy have been growing. The heavy losses of her CDU in Berlin on September 18 forced Merkel to cancel her trip to um, New York. That's, that explains why she was not present at that leader summit, but was represented. But the government was represented by Foreign Minister uh, Steinmeier. Instead, she defended herself and her policy internally in a remarkable press conference, uh, in which she appeared on the defensive, used uh, suddenly different wording, and admitted that already years ago mistakes were made concerning the Dublin regime, this regime of uh, thinking from the German side that, well, if people come to Italy or Greece, then we are in the middle of uh, European Union, they won't come uh, to us. With the numbers coming, this simply didn't work. So I interpret this actually as self-criticism, um, because she has not backtracked from the idea she does not want to fix a ceiling for um, uh, for refugees, I interpret this self-criticism as an indication that as early as 2013, I had mentioned the situation in the Mediterranean with regard to Italy, one should have strengthened the European southern periphery against immigration with measures that are being taken now with the joint European uh, uh, border police. Uh, stronger than Frontex and controls of a different uh, nature. Also, I interpret these words by Chancellor Merkel uh, that there should have been more development aid and investment in existing refugee camps in the Middle East. Because one of the reasons why, uh, apart from the escalation of the war in Syria, why we had this increase in the influx of refugees last year was 
that the, ration, the food rations in the refugee camps, because money was running out, were reduced to one meal a day. So if you have been living there uh, without a perspective for yourself and your family, uh, no wonder that you try to um, uh, attempt uh, other uh, escape uh, routes. Um, de facto, I would argue the European North had left the South, foremost Italy, uh, alone for uh, too long. Um, Merkel's approval ratings went down to about 40%, but they are now uh, slowly uh, recovering again. Uh, she stands at 44. Uh, I, I would say this is not bad for uh, a person who has been leading, uh, or the leader of government for 11 years. Um, it's still a remarkable number. So according to these li la latest polls that give her that rating, also the uh, current uh, go coalition of the Christian Democrats and the SPD uh, would still have a majority in Parliament. Um, it depends on the determination, the will of the Social Democrats, if they want to continue that or if they want to look for alternatives. I think that's, that's basically the main question we are facing in Germany uh, next year. As a consequence of voter trends, uh, the unexpected high numbers of refugees in Germany and the reluctance of other EU member states um, uh, to accept um, uh, more refugees, Germany's welcome policy has actually begun to be recalibrated already at the end of last year. President Joachim Gauck said, our hearts are wide, but our possibilities are limited. I think that's a truism. Um, and if you have such a high number of refugees for whom there is really no prepared infrastructure, you have to find ways of prioritizing groups like in any emergency. So one way of doing this was by reducing the number of countries whose citizens are automatically eligible for privileged status as refugees. Uh, before, there was a group like people from Montenegro, Kosovo, and Albania who could enjoy or claim refugee status. This has been changed. Um, we have had amend amendments to our asylum laws in, in November last year. Uh, and Algeria, Morocco, and Tunisia are going to be uh, next because also there the conditions are not such that uh, one could argue they are um, automatically um, recognizable as uh, or eligible as, as uh, political refugees. There may be single cases that have to be uh, examined on an individual basis but not a, uh, a, a generalized system. So such categorization has always uh, existed, um, but it becomes more essential to use these means if you know you are stretching your uh, resources. We are also working in Germany on faster procedures for repatriating uh, migrants who have committed crimes. Uh, there have been uh, uh, delays and there has been a reluctance to accept that these um, uh, cases uh, happen, which is one of the reasons for the uh, frustration of voters behind the Alternative for, for Deutschland. Um, the incidents in some German cities and in other European cities on New Year's Eve have shown that the reaction of the authorities also needs to be more robust if uh, there are assaults against uh, women, for instance, uh, by uh, uh, men from, with, a, with a migration background. Um, but these measures that we have taken as government since then have clearly not been sufficient to prevent the rise of the AFD, as the figures show. Um, I would close this, these remarks on uh, the domestic uh, situation by stating or restating that despite the growing opposition to the voters, 
of the voters to large-scale acceptance of refugees. The budget of the federal government for 2016-17 contains several billion euros in refugee-related expenses, mostly integration measures of all kinds, which will also be passed on to the lender uh, to enable them to uh, employ uh, teachers, uh, to teach German, and to uh, enable them to also um, um, increase uh, the law enforcement um, agencies. So this shows the ongoing commitment of the Merkel government to tackle the problem. I would argue that coming now to the um, humanitarian and other dimensions of the crisis, that uh, we can only look at the issue as a humanitarian issue. We cannot look at it like the immigration policy of the United States has mostly been uh, we need uh, to fill um, uh, certain labor positions or which we have also tried in, in Germany with, uh, with uh, very limited uh, success or to, to think that this could solve our demographic uh, problems in Germany. I think there are regions of the world where the uh, conditions for life are so bad that we simply have to accept there are these continuing push factors that will affect us because we live in a globalized world and we cannot only export our products. We also have to take responsibility for uh, what uh, goes on in other countries, especially if we have been involved at an earlier stage in changing situations uh, in uh, such countries or regions. So I think the, uh, especially the churches have uh, very well identified this humanitarian uh, character and um, it's, it's interesting that uh, the the uh, head of the bishops' conference uh, of the German bishops' conference, Cardinal Marx, from Bavaria, has had harsh criticism for the Christian Social Union headed by uh, Minister President Seehofer in Bavaria, because he has been the main critic of Merkel. So the bishops' conference and the and the Protestant churches are defending the policy that uh, the chancellor is uh, pursuing. Um, they, the churches in Germany at least, and I think that goes for a large part of the churches globally and certainly for the Catholic Church, uh, agree with the statements made by the UNHCR, High Commission for Human Rights, uh, for, for refugees, that this is the most severe refugee crisis since the end of World War II. I'm not Catholic, but uh, I find the speech that Pope Francis delivered before the U.S. Congress on September 24 last year quite remarkable. And I quote him, our world is facing a refugee crisis of a magnitude not seen since the Second World War. This presents us with great challenges and many hard decisions. On this continent too, thousands of persons are led to travel north in search of a better life for themselves and for their loved ones, in search of greater opportunities. Is this not what we want for our children? We must not be taken aback by their numbers, but rather view them as persons, seeing their faces and listening to their stories trying to respond as best we can to their situation, to respond in a way which is always humane, just, and fraternal." End of quote. Chancellor Merkel is not Catholic. She's the daughter of a Protestant pastor in whose house, I guess, a firm ethics code must have prevailed. So I see her entire value-based policy towards refugees against that background. And I do not, do not see, as some speculate, this as a particular guilt feeling for making good what happened uh, in World War II under the Nazis in the Holocaust and all that. I think it's far simpler than that. So let me come to some other aspects. Of course, security is an issue. Refugees, per se, 
are an indication of insecurity in other parts of the world. So apart from terrorism, the refugee issue deserves attention from a security viewpoint. And it is undeniable that terrorists are part of the reasons why people flee from their homes and that terrorists exploit uh, the situation of refugees. The, so the question, how can we minimize our risks, is uh, legitimate. Remarkably, though, the level of terrorism uh, has not uh, overall increased in Germany. The incidents that we've uh, seen that have made global news um, uh, were mostly not related with um, terrorism. We have had cases, in, as you know, in Paris and, uh, and Belgium. Um, but the situation overall, also the crime, general crime situation, has not deteriorated uh, according to the statistics in Germany. I think we are an adult audience today. So I think the main question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we uh, correctly assess our individual, correctly that means objectively assess our uh, risks? And the t statistics are clear. I mean, the statistics don't count if you have an incident in your family. I'm well aware of that. And I'm also not talking about uh, any lack of responsibility of uh, the state, of the government, to take all necessary precautions to protect us. But we have the responsibility as adults and the possibility as adults to simply recognize and state that my risk of being hit by lightning while I'm jogging is higher than being killed by a terrorist. My risk daily commuting between work and home is so much higher than being ever hit by a terrorist act. My risk of uh, uh, suffering something when I'm on a business trip in the United States is so far higher than going as a tourist to Europe and so forth. And I think if we have that attitude, there's one thing, we beat terrorists and we beat terrorism because terrorists are not interested so much in killing or maiming people. They are interested in the after effects, in sowing fear that people then change their system, that they, they forget about their freedom and all that. If we understand that we can uh, beat terrorism and terrorists. Economics. Um, there was some expectation that a German uh, highlighted by, by businesses when, to, uh, when uh, refugees arrived. Um, that, that now we could maybe have a larger pool of skilled labor um, and be, because we have almost full employment in many parts of, uh, of Germany and uh, there are many vacancies. So um, uh, th there are, uh, and there came uh, people who are highly qualified. We've had uh, pharmacists, uh, doctors, lawyers, uh, uh, teachers from, from Syria, um, um, but not all of them. There are many who are totally uneducated and uh, who, have, uh, who can barely uh, read and, uh, and, and write. Um, and then there's a language problem. You have to, in order to get a job in Germany, you have to speak German first, like mostly in the United States, you have to speak either English or, or Spanish uh, to find a job. So uh, I would argue these exp expectations that business had initially are growing dimmer. Um, also, the German uh, uh, work or job system is, is highly regulated. So uh, some of you may know the term Meisterbrief, Gesellenbrief, that you have to uh, have qualifications as, a, as an apprentice or a, a master to uh, um, perform, so even as a painter, a painting con contractor, you cannot just say, I, I learn how to, I know how to paint a wall, uh, which seems to be the case in some countries 
that I've lived in, uh, and uh, you, you have to do have you have to study and prove that you, you know the composition of paints and and so forth, or whether they do damage uh, if they are used inside the house and whatever. Anyway, so there's no uh, expectation, I think, that this was hel will help us with our economy. And that brings me back to the humanitarian issue. We have to look at it as a humanitarian issue. Demographics, I say, well, Germany grew uh, in uh, one and a half years by over one million uh, people. We don't know exactly how many of these people will stay. Uh, uh, we have a very low birth rate which is picking up recently, there was uh, headlines a few days ago, now we are at 1.5% uh, again, or 1.5% uh, again, and uh, so um, uh, that is not, not bad, but also that should not play um, a, a role. Although we have to state that about 20% um, of the people living in Germany have a migration background today. 20%. So Germans who left for the United States in the 60s and who would never have returned, they would not recognize the country uh, today due to that part, uh, large uh, uh, migration. So about 8% of people in, living in Germany are foreigners. We are indeed a multicultural uh, uh, society, whether that means that all the cultures get along with each other is a different uh, uh, story. Now, I'm not, I'm not preaching, preaching multiculturalism, but de facto, the, the, the homogeneity that um, characterized Germany until uh, the, or throughout the, uh, 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 the, the middle of the last uh, century, until the end of World War II, that is a thing of the past. Uh, so, um, legal as a final point, and then I come to the impact on the state of the European Union and closing remarks. Um, just to say briefly, and I've actually mentioned that our constitution uh, obliges us to grant people political asylum who's, who deserve it. And we are signatories, like the United States is, to the Geneva Refugee Convention, which also stipulates that uh, if uh, a refugee knocks on your door, you cannot just slam the door into her or his uh, face. The impact on the state of the EU. Other than some observers claim, I doubt that it played a major role for the decision of the Brexit supporters. In the British case, it was more the freedom of movement for people from other EU member states, from Romania, Bulgaria, and Poland, the cleaning ladies, the Polish cleaning ladies, that people of UK, the, the voters of UKIP were opposed to, because the United Kingdom was not in the forefront of accepting refugees from uh, Syria. By the way, as a, as a Commonwealth uh, nation, nation uh, which got rid of their co colonies uh, in the second part of um, the last century only, uh, they, they have many more uh, foreigners who are Commonwealth nations than, uh, than Germany has. But um, there was this clear opposition. I lived four years in London, as was mentioned in my CV, and. Uh, if you have questions on that, I have a very uh, particular view on, on uh, uh, the Brexit, what does it mean? But I'm not focusing on the, on the Brexit, I'm, I'm focusing on the rift between a majority of member states whose policies are determined by an anti-immigrant sentiment um, and between those who want to be respectful of the ideals embodied in their own constitution and the statutes of the European Union, plus the international obligations like the Refugee Convention I mentioned. I see this as a crucial question for the future of the EU. Uh, if a more even distribution of refugees among EU members cannot be implemented, and it doesn't look like it, there are theoretically uh, two extreme poles between which German policy will have to decide 
because you cannot tell the German voter to accept the, uh, the burden if no other uh, country is sharing the burden. And that plays also a role uh, in the critique of uh, the government policy. Chancellor Merkel has said, I will find a European solution. She's working hard for that, but so far, uh, so far the European solution in the sense that somebody steps up and says, well, I take 100,000 is not there. So de facto, Germany remains the one country uh, taking in um, uh, the, uh, uh, the bulk of, of, of people. Um, so the poles between which German policy will have to decide, do we adjust our, adjust means lower, our human rights uh, uh, standards uh, to the lower level of most other uh, EU members, not that we suddenly uh, start violating human rights, but saying, well, we, uh, we cannot uh, be too um, ambitious uh, or any longer as ambitious as we have been in the past. Uh, because we will be the only ones, um, or uh, do we? Uh, so, do we do that in order to save the cohesion of the European Union, or do we insist, as Germany, uh, maybe we find two or three more uh, with an idealistic approach, um, uh, uh, and thereby provoking uh, further fragmentation? and even the disintegration of the European Union. In practice, the result uh, will be in the gray area between these two black and white uh, extremes, and we are getting there. But I have said in previous occasions, and I might want to repeat that here, uh, the dimension of that question is actually, as I see it, similar to the conflict that this country, the United States, experienced uh, in uh, the Civil War, where the preserving the cohesion of the Union, at what price, had to be weighed, weighted with implementing uh, ideals of the North, abolition of uh, slavery. I think you can draw parallels, and it makes an interesting su study subject, certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm coming to the end, finally. Uh, we will have time uh, for uh, some uh, questions. I've been much, I just, I'm terrified. I didn't know I was going so long. But you haven't left the room, so it okay. seems to be OK. <laughs> we cannot exclude the possibility of a grandiose failure of the refugee policy uh, that Germany chose last year. And this grandiose failure would consist in a destabilized German government a weakened German economy and unbearable costs for society. We are far from that point. Germany has a strong economy and a stable government. And temporarily we have some relief. So far only 200,000 migrants this year have entered my country. 200,000 still. After a phase of improvisation with undeniable elements of chaos on the ground last year, this allows us to regain control and focus on orderly structures and procedures. Greater sympathy and awareness of the problem on this side of the Atlantic would be a tremendous help for Europe as a whole. No matter where one stands politically, the stability of Europe is in the interest of the United States. European instability would also negatively impact on transatlantic relations. Against this backdrop, apart from empathy, something else is relatively cheap, and that is every euro or dollar that we donate to guarantee decent living conditions in refugee camps carries us so much further than the same currency spent in our countries. And there are these empathetic people that I mentioned earlier, the student who I know personally in, in Cincinnati, uh, they are doing their uh, share. Um, you can get involved by simply um, donating. It's a worthwhile uh, cause. So let us be aware of this option, and let us also be aware of what we all uh, can do being um, conscious of the fact that we are not 
American citizens, German citizens, French citizens. We are global citizens who are all, to the same extent, affected by uh, poverty, inequality, uh, lack of human rights implementation, and so forth in the world. And that is something, um, I think, changing the world along those lines and contributing to improvements, something that uh, is a challenge and gives us all uh, a task for years to come, especially the many young people who are in this uh, uh, room. And I would like to finish by simply saying you've been very patient, uh, great audience. Thank you for your attention. And I'm ready to take questions if you have. Please. I think you just have to push a button where the little black triangle is. The microphone on now. I can hear you, sir. First, a disclaimer. I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump. Donald keeps talking about the impossibility of vetting all of these refugees. Could you tell us a little bit what the screening process is? The United States has, uh, as you know, uh, always had a very strong vetting or screening process. It takes two years for a refugee before, being, before applying to enter this country. And um, in, in Germany, uh, people, in the scenario that I, I explained, uh, people were simply there. There was no time to vet them. You know, and still, I would argue, uh, the uh, situation is not, uh, not bad that we have. Because people come to Germany in the majority, in the large majority, and I would, uh, I would say 99.99, what have you, percent, uh, 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 because they uh, want to live a life that is not possible in the country where they come from. And as we have seen in the uh, case where three Syrians uh, 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 arrested uh, uh, a potential terrorist who later killed himself, Ali, Akbar, uh, Ali Bakr in, in Leipzig last week, uh, that, uh, this, that this works. So uh, the question is easily answered. We have not had a vetting system uh, any far near the United States vetting system that con continues to exist in the United States. There is no case of a refugee coming into this country, and that's the advantage that you have because you have the Atlantic Ocean here, which can't be crossed by the makeshift boats which people use across the Mediterranean. You have the Pacific there. You have, the, um, you have uh, immigrants, certainly not from the north, but you have them from, from the south, but they are a different group, and that's a different, that's a different uh, uh, subject altogether, I would argue. Thank you. Welcome. Please. Hey, uh, you want to get a vote? Well, uh, we, we tell the people that we are uh, increasing uh, the uh, uh, border control and that we, are, that we want to get to a point where there is uh, um, prior uh, vetting possible. I was only describing the situation in my answer to the previous question, what, what we were confronted with, because if you have 10,000, 15,000 people coming a day, you can't process them. You can't in, put them in intern uh, nation camps or something like that, or concentration camps, which was discussed in Germany, but, but rejected. So 
Yeah, uh, th that is a question that the Chancellor has been uh, confronted with from the start, from her uh, uh, sister party, the Christian Social Union, uh, uh, fix, set, set a ceiling. Uh, the, the, the people can't, uh, the, the people want to know how many uh, we can take. She has, said, she has said we are a strong economy, we can uh, cope with the problem. I can't uh, fix the ceiling because what happens if I say 300,000, what do we do with the uh, person who is the first to cross that uh, line? The only, the, the, and, and, and it is unpredictable what will happen. Uh, in the Middle East, if the situation uh, worsens, <coughs> deteriorates, or whether we see some um, improvement eventually, we will. That's why I made the point about global citizens. Unless we realize that we are all in this together to some to some extent. I mean, you, you Americans may feel uh, detached uh, uh, from it um, uh, geographically, but you're certainly not as far as the involvement of your of your business is, your global uh, global outreach and and. Um, uh, of industry and, and culture and, and what have you, uh, the, um, uh, we, we have to do the utmost to uh, combat the root uh, causes. As long as the root causes are there, of which I've uh, given the, the majority, war and, and, and poverty, to have you, we will be faced with that, with that problem. We, can, we, we are dealing with the symptoms and we're not dealing with the, uh, uh, not yet enough with, with the causes. And whether, um, uh, whether um, a, uh, a military engagement uh, gets us uh, out of that situation or gets us deeper into this has at least for Germany been, been answered more to uh, the latter. And that's, that, that brings us back to why in the first place, this sort of unraveled in the Middle East. And you can talk to whoever you talk to, the, the, the broad majority view at least is that if, um, and I don't certainly, please do not misunderstand me, I do not want to uh, uh, do uh, United States bashing or so, it's, uh, I'm just repeating what uh, I hear from people who come to that assessment. If uh, uh, the war in Iraq in 2003 had not happened, we would not be in this mess. Gentleman behind, and then the gentleman over there. Um, I'm from Britain, and oh, the, uh, hi. I love the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys too. So, um, I think one of the main things that uh, Chancellor Merkel has been talking about is the unfortunate Brexit vote over the summer was fear, uh, fear of the refugee, and fear of the unknown. And I guess what I'm asking is, what can we do to change the negative image of the refugee so that this fear won't be controlled? Well, that's interesting because that contradicts what I say. I don't think it was the refugees. Uh, I think maybe that played into it, but I, my argument was that uh, it was. Um, the, um, the, the influx of other European uh, uh, member state citizens, so the freedom of uh, movement that, uh, that led to this reaction. Uh, uh, plus, uh, uh, what I consider a disinformation, a successful disinformation campaign uh, or by, the, by the Brexit uh, supporters, and uh, a feeling that you also have now in other European countries and in the United States, if I may say so, that well, we have to kick them in the butt. They are not doing they are not doing uh, their work properly, and they are not representing our our interests. And my my point is that. Uh, and maybe I can use that just to, to give you a broader view on how I see Brexit and what it will, will, will cause. Um, I, uh, I think first, I, I'm, I'm a believer that there are limits to a referendum. There are issues and there are sizes of a population which, uh, which cannot be solved in a referendum uh, with a rational result. Uh, meaning that yes, in Switzerland, in the cantons, uh, it, it works, 
but having a complex issue in which then in the, in, in the decision process of the individual voter, or which, is, which is determined by let's kick them in the butt, you come to irrational uh, decisions. And that's, that's terrible. And then why do I not see, I, I, I would have loved, and we, I, to, to, as uh, somebody who has been in the UK frequently and we spent four beautiful years in, in, uh, in London, uh, there's something that uh, I have been aware of all the time. Uh, the British people, especially the English, have never been in the European Union to the extent that continental Europeans have been. Uh, and uh, th that, that means, uh, with, the ex with the exit, that uh, to draw from that the conclusion that this will be the, the unraveling. No, they have, the Brits have always had opt-out clauses here and there. They've always had a special treatment. They were never there fully as the other Europeans were. So also their exit is something very special, which I feel sad about and I regret it and I, I would have loved to, uh, to change it. Um, and we will see where, it, I, I see the, the long-term results very negative for, for its economy, for its culture, for its politics, whatever. I do not see anything good in it that, that it, it may, may have. Uh, and this, what I just said about the mentality, was in a, uh, there was one commercial while I was uh, in, in London, maybe it's still uh, Lufthansa, the German airline, uh, advised by their, uh, by their British marketing agency, uh, they had a commercial publicity, it said, fly to Europe for 49 pounds. Where are you if you have to fly to Europe? <laughs> okay, uh, and, and, uh, and I think in a single sentence that summarizes the feeling. So Britain leaving uh, is, uh, is something totally dif different from uh, uh, the Netherlands leaving, uh, founding members leaving Italy or what have you. So um, yeah, I... Uh, I think it was not the, uh, I, you, you may be right, I don't, I'm not contradicting, I'm just having a different view. I don't think the refugees played uh, the focal uh, or key role in the decision process, may have played to some, some extent, but the result nevertheless is, is, is very tragic. There was a gentleman, right, yes, sir, and then we, we shall we take, can, do, can we take, uh, Okay, then we have the, after that, the lady back there and the gentleman in the, the red shirt. Do you have your, and then finally here. Okay, so we're back there. The question is, how German delivering countries are more welcome countries at least, same culture, same language, similarity. How can be more pressure on them to take some refugees from the war in Syria? Yeah, the question is, it's a, that's a good question. I have uh, maybe not such a good answer to that, uh, but my tentative answer is first, uh, 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 the refugees don't want to go there <laughs> because uh, because the situation uh, it may be it may be um, maybe no uh, no war and maybe they would even have possibility to work so forth but it these countries the Emirates Arab uh, Emirates United Arab Emirates and and Saudi Arabia are in the region no uh, seem to have no attraction. Whatsoever, and you cannot you cannot force uh, people. Uh, I mean, if they had offered refugee camps, I I, I think some of them are uh, uh, supporting financially, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the camps in the region in Jordan and and in Lebanon, uh, trying to also d d defuse this and and sort of outsource this in a way, but nobody wants to go there. 
Okay, I, I had given you the order, maybe I no, don't remember, but the lady was next, yes. Now, uh, state, there are state and non-governmental organizations aiding them. Nobody is starving. Uh, they, uh, uh, once they are uh, recognized as uh, legal refugees, they have a, a stay uh, guaranteed without any problems for three years minimum. And during that time, they can search work, they can benefit from integration measures like German uh, uh, lessons and so forth. The children go to school, they, all the children who are uh, uh, eligible for school are being schooled. We have uh, in the range of 60,000 unaccompanied minors who are being, that's one of the, the, the greatest challenges who are being uh, uh, kept in, uh, and, 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 and schooled in, in normal public schools. Um, and uh, if they have um, the, uh, the asylum uh, status or refugee status and can work, they can contribute to their, their income. I have, uh, they, they, are, they are, as soon as possible, we, we try to avoid uh, ghettoization. Uh, as soon as possible, they are settled in a vacant uh, apartments uh, all over the major cities. Uh, in the, I, have a, I own an apartment where I go when I, I'm on home leave in, in Berlin, and I uh, noticed this summer that there was a, a refugee family from Aleppo living um, uh, above us. And I talked to them, and they, they had fled uh, Syria uh, six months ago. And uh, we talked about the situation in, in Aleppo, in English, uh, because in rudimentary English, but the children, uh, one of the, the, the children who is, uh, I think, five, uh, is, is learning uh, German. Please. Yes. Uh, I was, I'm aware of the fact that both Lebanon and Jordan had major uh, refugee camps. <coughs> and we're requiring a, a lot of financial support through the UN and other sources. Have the numbers in those camps stabilized because they were just absolutely destroying the economy of, of those two countries because they couldn't cope with it, in, at least in anything I had read. Is that Change at all? Oh, it's, it's, it, I, I think uh, especially uh, Jordan, um, I would say also, also Turkey and Lebanon uh, deserve a lot of praise for uh, what they have been doing with their very limited uh, means. And even given what I said that uh, uh, euro or dollar carries so much far, further in the region than in our countries where uh, living standards are higher and life is so much more expensive, um, uh, that is uh, highly commendable. Uh, and uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, the, um, uh, the temporary financing programs of uh, the uh, UN camps, or, or camps maintained by the United Nations, uh, they have been solved for, for the year, that it is still uh, not uh, 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 very pleasant, comfortable situation is uh, out of the question in there. But they, they, I, I don't think there is any intention to m for major change of uh, these refugee camps or reducing uh, uh, the camps. They, they, are, they are trying to do their, continuing to, tr uh, to do their utmost. Thank you. <laughs> 